of my favorite people in the world. He's actually everyone's favorite person because I told this to you yesterday. I was on the phone with my dad and I was like, yeah, tomorrow I'm doing a podcast with Michael. And he was like, that is literally one of my favorite humans on planet earth. He's, he was dead serious too. And he's like, you can't help but feel joy around him. He's like, all I want to do is laugh and hug him every time I see him. That's, that is how everyone feels. And right. that's what we do, me and your and dad. All- we laugh and hug them the whole time. <laughs> oh, we, oh, we just sit there and hold each other. <laughs> it's not worried at all at Target. but <laughs> no. Is that, a, is that a beard color? Anyway, it, <laughs> it doesn't matter. Doesn't too matter. soon? Okay. Too soon. Uh, <laughs> I love your dad. He's such a nice, oh nice gosh. person. Gosh. I did say before this that I was going to try really hard to be serious because the thing about Michael B is he is an actor comedian and that's like how most people know him. He's been in a lot of films and, and actually you introduced me to my awesome camera guy. Sean, you guys have yes. done, you guys have done films. Many together, a thing. Awesome. So thank you for that. Um, and so you've probably seen a lot of hilarious stuff with him and, uh, this is weird. This is weird for us to talk in normal voices because we don't normally, <laughs> Yeah, we're, we have like 70 voices we use when we talk, and we're always impersonating something or someone. And I have my, my Utah mom voice going on. <laughs> what a blessing it is, and we're just, what a delight to have you here. And then you always have like one of your 70 voices going. Anyway, I'm trying. I'm going to try. Be serious. So a lot of people know you from that realm. They know you from like being actor, comedian, and... Um, but what a lot of people don't know is that you've actually been to hell and back. Yeah. <laughs> you've yeah. been through some hard stuff. And actually, I want to rephrase it. You've overcome some really, really difficult things. Um, do you mind telling us a little bit about your journey? Sure. Um, and yeah, and, then, and those, uh, those hardships were, I'll start by saying they were a product of my choices. We had, we had issues, with my ex-wife and I, but I made difficult choices that didn't help right and uh and and uh deteriorated my personal life as well as uh, my family life but i took that from that point and my life wasn't getting any better and i was having kids and i started drinking and then i started doing cocaine and those are really the two main things i did i mean I smoked weed when i was uh, a little older but i did and i kind of did it in, in private for a long time I, I didn't even do it with people i did it completely alone I didn't want anyone to know what I was doing. That's a sign of a real addict right there. Yeah. That, You're not doing it for social reasons. Oh, yeah, yeah. In fact, years went by before. <laughs> this is so bad. When we shot the singles ward, the movie, uh, and the RM, and the home teachers, uh, and single second ward, and I did not. I'm actually to name a few. <laughs> uh, I was higher than a kite the entire, all those years. I I I didn't I didn't have an issue with the, the gospel, with the with the church and belief and doctrine. None of that. My personal life, I just kind of allowed it. I took a I took a parting lifestyle. But early on, I became a dealer and an addict. And it, it, addict's a, a unique word because most people just assume if you're an addict, you're on skid row on the street and you're yeah. laying in a, in a no, blanket. No, those high functioning um, addicts. Yeah, yeah. high functioning addict. And I. I never did things to where I passed out because um, I, don't, I don't like feeling sick, but I couldn't stop. Yeah. And, uh, and I think it took me a few years before I realized man, I am addicted. Uh, and so I needed to kind of figure that out. But So my, I my partner got to, a, to a, about as heavy as it could get. And uh, one day uh, I left a comedy club that we, that we owned and I, I never drove. Never in my life I've driven after I've drank or done any any type of drug or whatever. Somehow I got my keys and got my car. And I don't think I made it. I think it was about a mile down Geneva Road. Of, yeah. and, uh, and I woke up the next morning, and I was naked in this field. At first I thought, did I get, like, taken? Did I get beat up? I, I, I thought I'd I get raped. I, I No reason why I'd be naked in the middle of this field. Right. Then I sit up and I'm like, okay, my arms are moving, legs work, everything's working. And I see my clothes kind of spread out and down at the end at the street, my car is still running. It's pretty early in the morning. I, to this day, I have, I have no memory for about three months up to this when I woke up. So I never got those three months of memories back. But 
amongst many other memories I've destroyed, sadly. But the uh, so I uh, I got my clothes on piece by piece, and then I got to the car, and it was my son's birthday, and uh, I said that day I'm like I'm never gonna do drugs again. Wow. And something it just something about that moment. I don't know how to explain it, but there's something about that moment where everything kind of like put right in my face, like, what am I doing? How did I allow myself? I'm, I was a strong, young person. I, how did I allow myself to get to this point? Uh, and I just said, I'm, I can't do it anymore. And I wasn't dumb enough to say, I'm going to stop everything. I still drank, and I committed to June 1st, uh, 2008 to stop drinking as well, but and I never did. I haven't touched drugs since. Wow. And however, for all those who are listening, if you're going to go through detox, go ahead and grab a friend. Uh, <laughs> I need to go to a medical professor and don't go to a hotel room and do it by yourself. Is that what you did? I did. It was, uh, oh. it was horrific. It was, it was horrible. I'm surprised I didn't throw myself out of a window. It was oh. It's like the worst. It's the worst. There is no. It's, it's interesting because I hear people that have said, man, I've. I've detoxed three times. I'm like, three times? Ugh. I I don't want to do anything that I have to go through that again. At one time. And um, it was motivating. But anyway, I pulled through that. And I, like, man, I got I to gotta fix my life. And that's when I started going back to church. Wow. And even though at first, I, you know, anyone feels that, like, that, you know, you get a lot of guilt. Because you're like, oh, my gosh. People can see right through me. The walls are going to fall down, which is so dumb. It's the dumbest thing ever. Um, everyone there has issues. Everyone. Yeah, everyone. And it, there's a point when you realize, where did I discount myself from the atonement of Jesus Christ? Where did I feel like I did not fit in or I wasn't right. uh, available for it or capable of, of having that in my life? Or worthy, something? yeah. So, uh, and so many interesting things happened along the way to get me to where... Uh, I, I never saw today. I I could have never seen today. It's like a second life. Be remarried, have more children. I thought, man, at most I'm, I'll live till I'm like maybe forty, and I'll just die in a wreck or something stupid i just thought i i didn't think i was uh able or worthy to to really kind of have anything uh good in my life and and that's where the devil plays his greatest trick on people is that you know you're not worthy you're not good enough or you're not whatever and none of that's true there's nothing you can do that you cannot take yourself away from the love of our heavenly father you can't no matter what you do or what you believe yeah, or what you believe, yeah. Even if you don't believe in there's a God, he still loves you anyway. Yeah. He loves all his children. You know, sometimes you go to church, it's like the same lesson where you can... Or you feel topic, like everyone, but, like no one's been through anything, or everyone yeah, there is so perfect. Nothing personal. And So anyway, I, I they asked me to teach, and this is like my first time as a top after the year 2000. I brought in this Bible. It's a New Testament. And I said, does anyone know what this is? It's a small New Testament. And... uh they're like, oh, is that like a chaplain's New Testament? I was like, no. What, does anyone else know what this is? Uh, did you get it at the library? No. And uh, anyway, I just said, this is the New Testament I got when I was in prison. And wow. if you open up, you can see my prisoner number. You can see my cell number. Wow. Um, and the reason why I, I intro that is because when I was behind bars, the 50th time so stupid not not everything was like criminal just i but no I drug did. use and, and yeah. prison usually go hand in hand yeah they <laughs> don't they <laughs> don't i mean they? i'm doing drugs and i'm not a hypocrite I'm just kidding. anyway <laughs> anyway so the uh uh it, it was it was a good reminder for anyone in their life because no matter what everything looks the same when you show up on a sunday Everyone appears to have the same life, the same experiences, because no one ever goes deeper. And I 
We need that. I love that you did that. Uh, we and I, I need people. I need people to go deeper with me. Yeah. I had no one to share it with. No one. I had not. I had no one to share my experience with because the second you start to open up, like man, I'm really struggling. Like I, I found myself drinking or I'm doing cocaine or like. Yeah, I, I mean, do you need help with your lawn? Whoa, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like uh, they don't, they, no one really wants to go there with you. So the whole point was talking about the New Testament, and so why the New Testament meant so much to me. Well, it started right here in that little book, uh, and it kind of recharged my life again. So the uh, so that's that was the story of the. That's and so then after, cool. like, man, I had no idea. I'm like, you don't know much about anybody. Because everyone has their issues, whether you've been to jail or not. Like, I've never used drugs or been to jail, but I have, I always say this, I have way too many of my own shortcomings and sins to worry about anyone else's. I don't, I don't have any room or space in my life for that. Like, I just want to be there for you. Please be there for me. Like, we're all struggling. Yeah. Well, the way you just said that is the second you open up to a person to a deeper level, even if it makes them uncomfortable, if something goes wrong in that person's life, you were the first person they'll go yeah. to because they know for a fact you'll go to hell with them. Yeah. For lack of a better term. And be there and, so, and not judge you. Yeah, at all. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't, when Christ said, I judge no man. I, 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 I can't, I can't judge people. I don't, I don't, I don't know where they are. I was lost and alone and scared for so long and, I don't want anyone to feel that way. So what advice do you have to someone who's struggling with, whether it's addiction or something else that's brought them just to such darkness? How do you, how do you get well, back to a place of happiness and real joy? I'll tell you, this is a, this is a great question because no one ever asked this question, to be honest with you, Christina. I've done several podcasts, and, they, and uh, expose is generally what people like the most. But going in deeper of, about what, it, I'll tell you. It, this sounds really simple. You have to stop. Stop everything. Slow down. Stop. And sit quietly for a minute. And that is the same thing when it comes to drugs and alcohol and any other addiction a person has. And even though those are mine, there's many other addictions people have. And, uh, and I, it, you have to stop. You go to rehab, that's great. You go to a program, that's great. Go to classes, do whatever. Use family members, whatever. But you have to stop. Um, and it's it's really interesting. There's a there's a uh, story. Everyone knows a story from the New Testament. There's a woman on the street who was uh, accused of adultery, and, and they're about to stone her. And they, of course, they go to Jesus and they ask him, you know, which is woman's been caught in adultery. I still don't understand the symbolism, but I think it's awesome that he went down and just started like drawing some stuff on the dirt, like right, right, go on. I love that he made them wait. Yeah, like it's like like how about a, what a cool thing to do. It's Such like, a power move. <laughs> um, and then I, and then, and then he says, uh, "Any of you is without sin, that sin, because they were all adulterous men, and uh, and more than likely some of them been with that woman, and uh, and they'll leave, and then he." He tells her, he says, where are thine accusers? Me, Lord, I have none. Neither do I accuse you. And then he says, go and sin no more. Not, Peter, I'm sorry that happened to you. Stop what you're doing. You can't do it anymore. If you want to be happy, if you want resolution, if you don't want to find yourself on the street with people throwing rock, you can't do this anymore. And it's such... There was no parable. There's no story of a fish. Some things in life are just, you can't do this anymore. He didn't say it was going to be easy for her to, to deal with that problem, how she makes money. I don't know if she's a single mom. I don't know anything. I don't know anything about her except for that moment. And so what I found is I, I created this love affair with dealing with problems. Mm. I wanted to deal with a problem. I didn't want to run away from it. I didn't want to hide from it. I didn't want to disguise me. I'm something... And I didn't want um, that part of my personality to be controlled anymore because it, it totally was. And I, not everybody can just stop something one day and not do it again. I, I understand. I didn't do it with drinking. I did it with drugs. But 
sometimes it takes people years but to get to that point, but anyone can do it. Uh, and, and what drives you to that point or what keeps you from going back is the ability to transition and replace whatever thing you're doing with something else. Totally. You know what's so interesting? You know my brother, Josh. Yeah. In fact, Josh um, loves Michael because when he first Josh. moved here, he's like, I've never met someone who has a very similar story to, you know, his kids got taken away. And that's in a, a podcast that I did with him too, but um, from his drug use and addiction. His replacement, when he, when he finally got clean from heroin and meth and everything, was fitness. And so he ended up, within a few years, breaking the world record on weighted dips. But he, I mean, it's an addict personality. You have to oh, yeah, <laughs> replace. Yeah, I'm not yeah. saying replace one addiction with another, yeah. but replace it with something that is a good thing to be habitual with, you know. And so he, um, yeah, that's what he replaced it with. And when you say you detox in a hotel room by yourself, Oh my goodness. That reminded me. He's probably told you this story when he was, he went to jail too several times. And, uh, when he was addicted, when he finally got clean and detoxed in jail, uh, he was going through such bad withdrawals and the way, and tell me if this is your situation too, but the way he describes it is it felt like every bone in your body is breaking and you're going to die without that next hit. And you're sick in every way possible. Just, you feel like, how can you still be alive and be in this much pain? Is that, has that been your experience? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, it's, it's weird. In your head, you're like, all I need is this yeah. amount, and this all goes away. Yeah. And, oh, and it has so much control. It, or you don't have it. Yeah. It, like in his situation where he, I, I so wasn't going to do it, and you just, yeah, I felt like all my organs were shutting down. Oh. It was bleeding out of my ears. Oh. I'd thrown up so much, and I... Had this bloody nose. It just I I couldn't stop my nose. I I passed out a couple of times, and I get up and I clean up a little bit, and my it felt like my stomach cramped from like my ankles to my neck, it was just like pulling inside and just like ripping into my gut, and I oh. and just it'd fall on the ground. I, I it wouldn't matter if it was on the bed or the ground. It, there was no comfort, and I just kept looking at that window like man, these are like the 1950s windows. I could break through that thing. Oh. I thought that in my head, and then I'm like, just don't, don't think that it's that stupid. Oh. Uh, but yeah, it's it's the worst. And and what sucks is you realize, man, how, in, for me, I thought, how do you, in a spiritual way of your life, people do the same thing. They do the same thing. They 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 withhold so much, and. Our Heavenly Father is just waiting to give, waiting to give. You've got to turn to him, just like in the prodigal son story. And the second you turn to him, he will run to you. But he can't go and force you to do something because he takes away your ability to choose. Yeah. But the second you choose to turn, he appears and runs, falls on your neck, and kisses you. It's a robe. Does it over and over. He is tireless. He'll do it with you over and over. And when it's all said and done, you don't get to go and have some family members pat you on the back. There's always... The repercussions from all your decisions. Yeah. I, I know what it feels like when you deny something that you know is so true and you're, you feel so close to God and then you take yourself so far away. And sometimes just like, man, please. Yeah, forgive me, Please. I need it so bad. And he does, of course. Of course he forgives him. He's already forgiven. And it's always based around love. Any addict that's recovered, you, you will find they have a level of love you, you've never seen with a person because they've oh, yeah. met themselves in the darkest point. That That's that's why you and my brother immediately bonded. My brother's the same way you know. He's so compassionate and full of love for people. Oh, my gosh. He never is. judge. He's just been through so much and is still going through that pain, as you know. Like, just, I mean, even though he's been clean for 10 years, just the repercussions of those decisions oh, yeah. are so painful. Not being able to see his three children that he loves more than anything. And, you know, it's hard. So, is life better sober? Oh, my gosh, man. Is it worth yeah. the detox and everything else? It's worth every, it's ever worth every ounce of pain your body, organs, whatever will go through. You're, how does yeah. someone, I mean, cause you went to a hotel room 
and detoxed and it's horrific. Like, yeah, I went to some programs after because uh, I I went to AA and went to then the following year, but I went to went to different uh, drug programs and yeah. to be with other people and uh, yeah, I mean you you need that support because you find that most people can't relate and so they won't relate. And so have you been to our, so the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has the ARP program, the Addiction yeah. Recovery Program. Um, have you been to that? Yeah. It's very similar to AA, but they just incorporate a lot more of like God and spiritual yeah. aspects of it. Yeah. Um, and I, I went several times with my brother. I am not exaggerating when I say I, there is only one or two places on planet Earth that I have been to that I have felt that powerful of a feeling. I felt like I was not worthy to be there when people were going around the table and saying what they struggle with and, you know, and the hard week that they had. And, and, you know, one person who was strong week before had just had a bad week or I don't want to call it a bad week, but they slipped up. And I, I did not even feel worthy to be there. I, I just was like past, like, I didn't, I didn't want to say anything and ruin that power. Those are people who are humbly, I mean, the, the depths of humility wanting to change and I don't think that there's there's few things that are more powerful than that like want, you're being humble you're being honest you're wanting to change you're there for the right reasons so amazing like I, I just I can never judge anyone even though I've never done drugs or drank even like I've never done anything like that I have so much respect for people who can get clean who can give up whatever their addiction is so much respect because there's that takes some serious courage and strength that's amazing. You're amazing. You're a miracle. You've helped so many people. And I know that it's not, not just from this podcast, but like I've been around you enough years now. I've known you for almost 15 years now. Th that's the thing though that everyone loves about you is you're so real and you're like, you'll talk about the deepest stuff. And even like when I asked you to do the podcast, like I knew that you'd be an open book. I knew you'd talk about like whatever, because you're there to help people and you want to help people. And you're not, you're, you're not about living a lie. You're about like, let me just share the real, the good, bad, and the ugly. And it helps so yeah. many people. And you're also super funny, you know? It's interesting. And sexy, I know. Well, you know, it's let's be honest, obviously. just my good looks. You know, great There's stories more about to me. people and taking shots. There's more to me. Let me see. I'm gone. See, uh, I'll, uh, I will say this. This is, this is interesting because, and, and then I won't say more about this, but sometimes when a person, they'll, they'll look at a person where they are now, and they're like, uh, I could not be like that guy. Like Josh probably thought that before he overcame it. And I, and I used to think that as well. We were at church one Sunday, and this guy came in, and uh, it's crazy. He's an I mean, raging alcoholic, but he would he ran marathons. I've never seen a raging uh, run marathons, but wow. anyway, he came into church one day, and I was sitting with the kids, and my wife was there, and he comes and she goes, "Hey, how's it going?" She knew his his wife. And he's like, oh, "No, okay, man, I just you know." Alcohol, I'm dealing with some, I did too much alcohol, I drank too much, I'm, I really shouldn't even be here. He's like, he goes, oh, yeah, Michael used to be an alcoholic. And uh, and all I heard was, Michael used to be an alcoholic. And I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> with my kids, you're my small. And, um, the, uh, and he was like, really? I said, do I not look like one? And he's like, no. I was like, what does it look like? And he's like, anyone. Uh, yeah, not you. I was like, do you think it looks like you? It could be anybody. Yeah. You would you would have no idea. You don't look any different than anyone else to someone else. You do so when you're, you're uh, I mean, you're drunk, obviously, but you, no one would know. But it just goes to show you, be available to people and yes, and, and confront them on it. Because my wife's like, oh, did you want to use your crybaby story about being an alcoholic? Because this guy was an alcoholic and uh, and was going to prison, all sorts of crap. So. Wah. So why don't you talk yeah. to him? Because there's more to life, and that's kind of her perspective of. Yeah. Just, and it changed things because he and I, and we did talk and love it. I love you know. that you're vulnerable. And my brother's always given me permission. He's like, yeah, you can tell anyone. So like, even sometimes when I've introduced him, like he's the coolest guy you'll ever meet because he's overcome so much. I'm just so proud. I love my brother. You know that. Oh, and I yeah. love you. Oh, I love all you guys. I love you too. Uh, anyway, I really appreciate that. Thank you so much for doing this today. Yeah. You're awesome.